Good evening and welcome to the June 22nd meeting of the Portsmouth Planning Board. Um, Mr. Simonis, would you be willing to sit for Mr. Hewitt, who's not here this evening? Yes. That gives us uh, more than a quorum. I think everybody else is regular members. We are continuing the public hearing this evening on consideration of the City Council recommendation to adopt amendments to Chapter 10, Article 5A, Character Based Zoning, Section 10.5A20, Regulating Plan, Subsection 10.5A2110, Contents of Regulating Plan, Map 10.5A21B, Building Height Standards, Section 10.5A4330, Building and Story Heights, Subsection 10.5A4333. Section 10.5A4340, Maximum Building Footprint, Subsections 10.5A43.41-44, to and Section 10.5A45, Community Spaces, Subsection. Figures 10.5A4510, Community Spaces, sec Section 10.5A4620, Requirements to Receive Incentives to the Development Standards, Subsections 10.5A4621-22, to and Article 15, Definitions, Section 10.1530, and there's also one other one on tonight that we'll perhaps have as a separate recommendation for council. So as a continuation of the public hearing, because there has been some additional work done in the last week, uh, we've asked Principal Planner Nicholas Cracknell to assist with walking us through those which were posted, unfortunately, just this afternoon. We've all been busy in trying to get this stuff together. And the planning board also just received its copy this afternoon. So, Nick, if you'd be so kind. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for the record, Nick Recknell in the planning department. Uh, as the chairman pointed out in response <coughs> to last week's meeting and the primary issues that were raised by the, the folks that were here last Thursday, uh, we've been working at the staff level with the chairman to put together a response to talk about some mod modified language here, or amendments to the amendment that would actually address uh, all, if not the lion's share of the issues that were raised here last Thursday. So just to recap the issues, at least the top ones, and it's not all inclusive what, what I'm about to put out here for a list, or I'm not prioritizing it, but there were questions about uh, the building footprint size uh, that, that's in the ordinance and in the incentives and some concern that the building footprint size was maybe a little on the large size for the incentive. Uh, there were questions about the workforce housing uh, requirements, both the amount, the percentage. There were discussions about the, the minimum size of the unit. Uh, there was a question about whether the ordinance should reference more clearly the master plan and any of the goals, objectives, and strategies in the community master plan. Uh, additionally, there, were, there was a conversation about the community space types, and I think it was clear, we, you know, we came in with the three community space types last week that were in the original amendment that was sent here from the City Council. We had a discussion back at the work session in May and at the Land Use Committee, which has a couple of planning board members on it, including the Chairman, in uh, late May about including things like shared streets or even community buildings. So we had a, a, a brief discussion last week about maybe bringing those back because they were not here uh, last Thursday, <clears throat> those two commu community space types. And then there was a, a couple of more clerical issues, so not primary issues that were substantive, but clerical issues uh, relating to the minimum community space requirements if you don't have housing in the project. Because I think I, I pointed out uh, last week when this was originally submitted to the to the council for the first reading, there was an in lieu payment option for small projects, and that was removed uh, at the request of the legal department, given their review of the state statute. And when we removed the in lieu payment uh, program that would be used for small projects, it meant that uh, projects like the brick market, which has no housing, and now requires 30% community space would only be required 10% in what we were looking at from the City Council. So we wanted to put that back in that it's at least 30% for no residential units in a project or 10% and workforce housing. Uh, the other thing uh, that I'm not sure how it happened for last week was each of the three incentives have requirements for workforce housing. And the first uh, incentive for the big, large building footprint for some reason, Section F got deleted 
So it was in the, the city council uh, version, never got here. I put it back in. So I think what makes sense, unless the chairman would like to proceed differently, is we've got the document that you were given this afternoon that has the, the, uh, the amendments from the council in blue underlying text that you've seen before with the red strikeouts. It's also got the yellow highlights from not just the legal department, but staff and the land use committee and your own work session back on the 25th of May. Those uh, amendments you also had last week, they're highlighted in yellow. And then what's new is simply the highlighted text uh, in gray. Um, I think it's labeled maybe blue on the front, but when we printed the, the document in blue, it, it doesn't read well. Uh, the blue is too dark, so it's actually a gray highlight. I think that's what we're going to see, right, Peter? Yes. Does that make sense, Mr. Chairman, to go yes. through it that way from front to back? It's not going to take a great deal of time. I'm going to focus only on really the gray text, uh, what's changed from last week in a response to the comments many of you um, in attendance provided. So the, the, okay, the, gray, well, the gray areas yeah. are not gray areas. They just happen to have gray color. There you go. Right, right, right. Thank you. Uh, this amendment here was, was not really discussed. Uh, I don't think it was this. I don't remember discussing it. Uh, the, the, the chairman, this was one of his contributions to the amendments before you. So I'll, if I muddle this, I'll turn it back to you. But this was not part of the original, this paragraph that's on the screen, which is on your second page all alone. It's a provision in the code right now that speaks to, <coughs> excuse me, municipal properties. <coughs> and in the past, as I understand it, the genesis of this amendment is in the past, there's been some confusion about whether the city's land use boards have jurisdiction when the city owns a piece of property but leases it to a third party that may or may not be a nonprofit or or city governmental use. <clears throat> so my understanding is the RSA, and that's why it's here, makes it clear the city, the city's land use boards do have jurisdiction for a private use of a public property, uh, which is why I think you've got this amendment in this tranche. Uh, I'm not sure it can stay here with the, the second reading, it might need to come back and start over, but is that a general, uh, the general sense of why yes, it's been the, added? The exclusion is for governmental use, and <clears throat> as I understand it from talking with the city attorney just before the meeting, if the board is in agreement with this, and I think it's an important correction to the zoning ordinance, it would be a separate recommendation to council, apart from our other recommendation on the 5A section that I read. So hearing that, uh, that's what I thought you were going to say. It sounds like when we're done tonight going through the amendment to the incentive-based uh, uh, districts in the character districts, th if you would like to proceed with this, it would be a separate vote to send this to the city council to, to start the rezoning process for this particular paragraph because it's outside the scope of what's been sent to us, you, from the city council, correct? The alternative would be to re-notice the entire thing, but I think this is on a, the other sections are on a fast track, which is why we have been scrambling so much. So that's why I think we could split it. Okay. So let's jump back into the, the discussion from last week and the 25th of May. Uh, the highlighted sections here, I'll get the pointer. This was a response to, uh, if this turns on, Right here, there's a, an example of the, of the highlighted gray text. So this language was not here last Thursday. What essentially we're doing with the not more than five as an example, uh, dwelling units, I'll read the sentence. For, develop, for development or projects with, with more than five dwelling units, at least 10% of the property shall be assigned as community space. And then you've got to meet the workforce housing requirements. So the reason we put that in there was to deal with the fact, again, we don't have in lieu payments. And if you've got a project with five or fewer units, they would be putting in you know, one workforce housing unit, which would be a, a, an economic imposition compared to a 10 or a 12 unit project that also only has to put one. So these small projects uh, do not have to meet the workforce housing requirements. Remember, these are the, in the incentives, not the baseline underlying zoning. So if you've got a project with no more than five units, or sorry, with more than five, yeah, six or more, you've got to meet the workforce housing requirement. If it's less, you don't. And if you don't, you have to have 30% community space, not 10. So this is back to the, 
the brick market example where there was like 32 percent community space around the brick market uh, because that's the current standard 30 percent or more and we wanted to make sure with the yellow text last week that we don't forget uh, to to make sure projects that have no housing like the brick market don't go from 30 to 10 uh, because that's not what we want we want to keep them at least where they are today Um, in that same section, since you are in the <coughs> section about overall section maximum building footprint, I see that you did add back in E that was missing. Yes. Um, and my question is, the way that it's worded, it says, for projects with over the five dwelling units, at least 10% of the dwelling units within a building shall be workforce housing un units in compliance with state law. What 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 is that? What are you referring to? What are we referring to when we say in compliance with state law? In what way? It's the state law in reference to workforce housing. So the workforce housing requirements under the RSA is what's being referred to. So you just mean the standards? It would clar actually have clarified if we added the word qualifications between state law and for either. That because it's the state law is qualification criteria. Well, the state law, do, this, this kind of gets to the point I wanted to make, which is the one point I feel you overlooked in your introduction was the conversation that we had last time about the size of these workforce units, which is not stipulated in the state law. Correct. And which used to be in the previous version in the original version that we are now overall amending it was 800 square feet but now it's been reduced to 600 square feet and I I think we should discuss that because I really disagree with the 600 square feet I've looked I, I, I I've looked a lot at what I am assuming is sort of an equivalent, which is manufactured housing. I'm looking at other affordable housing and what kind of space is made available. And like for instance, the largest single wide, like mobile manufactured home I could find was 780 square feet. So it's still greater than the 600 feet. So. You know, Mr. Chairman, I, I still question this 600 square feet that's throughout the document. I think it should be larger. I actually, I would prefer that it be the original 800 square feet because of the standard for quality of life that we are setting for families of three or four people looking for affordable housing. Um, Beth, did you have a comment? Uh, just about the mobile homes. I mean, the some of the brand new mobile homes that are just going went on the market at um, Woodbury um, Co-op. Uh, most of them were 660 square feet, if I remember correctly. So there are actually a lot of mobile homes that are are smaller than that. Well, I mean, I know that there is a tiny home and a tiny mobile home, you know, um, trend in some cities in America, but. Everything that I've seen about those, do, they do not hold three and four people. So. I thought there was a discussion, if I may. You may. Last week. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I apologize for, for sort of passing through that quickly. It, it was definitely identified as an issue, but it wasn't identified as a solution beyond what was there last week in what's in front of you. So I agree with that. It was left at 600. You know, I don't think myself there, there's huge magic with the number. Uh, it, you had mentioned, Councillor Moreau, last week about maybe two numbers. Uh, the two bedrooms is the minimum standard, not the size of the unit. We talked about that last week. I, I mean, I think it, personally, I think it's important the number not be too big because it's the floor, not the ceiling. And these things, again, you're focused on downtown. You're not focused on the gateway. You're not, this is not applicable outside downtown Portsmouth where square footage is at an all-time premium in respect to the construction cost of putting it together. So I think I would suggest if you're going to amend it, you come up with a number closer to 600 than 800, even if it's 700 somewhere down the middle, because again, it has a pretty big impact on 
attracting somebody to even do this. Remember, this isn't required unless you ask for the carrot, for the conditional use permit. The underlying zoning doesn't require any workforce housing. So I think we've got to be sensitive to the economics downtown. They're very different than Lafayette and other parts of the community in respect to the opportunity cost of having and providing workforce housing. So you, the number, I, yeah. I, I appreciate you know, your comment, but I also think that you know, it is our job to make sure that this is equitable and that that doesn't translate into single workers only being able to live in this workforce housing because that is not the intent of the law. I think uh, we have the, the existing, the 600 in there, you're suggesting possibly 800. That's uh, what originally was in there. Greg has a comment here in a second, and I think last week Beth mentioned, and I think I also may have suggested the idea of possibly having two, one for rental, one for, for sale. For, um, but There was also so, a comment about ADUs being 750 square feet. Right. So let's, this is, I mean, we're at that point in the ordinance, so. Um, Peter, right. can you scroll down to that paragraph just in case we're going to add it? Yeah, go. right there. Yeah, it was actually well, the next paragraph from the one we were talking about, but anyway. No, Greg, it's, no it's right there. It's right there. The oh, second I know, one. but we were talking about the state statute. Well, okay. well that, I think that was well, here. they relate. That's yeah. also in Square footage. Yeah. Okay. Well, do people want to think on that? Greg, or did you, did you, you going to say something, Peter? I have a housekeeping oh. comment, um, a little different. So we've got three pillars here, density incentive for building with underground parking, number two, density incentive for overlay incentive districts, and number one and three, whatever the heck that is, density incentive for parcels with over one acre area lot. In density incentive for over one acre lot, the reason I'm saying this now is because it's missing from number one, but it's in number three. When you define workforce housing, your definition, and I'll just quote, it's line five. For a four person household, Paragraph two, 5% of any proposed four rent dwelling units within development or at least two units, important differentiation, three words, whichever is greater. Now that clarification, whichever is greater, is missing from the other two incentives, one and two. Yeah, I, I can speak to that if, if you want me to. Sure. Yeah. So the, the difference between the first two incentives and the third is you are required in the third to do, uh, if you want this incentive, you have to do housing and you have to provide workforce housing. So there's no opting out for a small project under five units in the third example. We, we require in this draft a mixed use project for workforce housing, which is why we have the percentage with the minimum amount of units. We didn't change that text. The other ones. Why if, shouldn't they match up? Because they're all three definition of the requirement. And it's just like when you go and clarify in paragraph F in each one of them, calculations for workforce, house, workforce housing units should be rounded up from 0.5. So if you've got a definition in three sections that are similar, the three words make them different. They should be the same because if it's whichever is greater should be common among all three. I can go either. You can do that if you need to do that. Well, you didn't explain why you took it out of the other two. Why it's in one, which whichever is greater is an enhancement to workforce housing, where it's missing from the other two. So they should be common. Nick, why don't you think about that while we talk about size for a minute? Because okay. we, didn't, we didn't resolve that. Um, yes, and and ju I'm just going to say piggybacking on all of this. One of the things that makes it so difficult to review and re-review and re-review different versions is the original text is now not even shown as a strikeout. So, you know, like it doesn't even show the 800 feet that was in the original <coughs> ordinance that we are now revising and amending. And it doesn't, so it's. Well, to that end, I mean, yeah. quite honestly, getting a revision at four o'clock to me is offensive, and if we don't get this resolved quickly, I'm in a motion to continue. So we have 600, 800, possibly something in the middle. Would somebody like to propose? 750, because that's what's in the ADUs. For both? 750. For both? Yes, sir. I'll second that motion. So that was a motion and a second. <clears throat> Any discussion? 
Do you want to vote on that now? Or do you want to just have consensus? Or? Well, yeah. that conforms to state law. Is that correct? State law, state law doesn't require. regulate state size. Law state law doesn't regulate size. State law, too bad. Right? What I said about state law was qualification. State law just specifies qualifying income levels. That's what defines workforce housing. State law doesn't say how much you have to have, just says you're supposed to have your fair share, and that's a separate thing. Um, but the units for sale and the units for rent are separate calculations based right. on the median income levels that are published and are recently published. In fact, Jane shared that the other day with me. So um, right, that's what state law is. A, in this section, it's a qualification criteria. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, I don't know that we need votes on each of these things. If we, if we have consensus, if we don't have consensus, I mean, are folks okay with 750 or? Uh, yeah. I could be okay with 750. I, you know, the market forces, they can go up. It's consistent the with the ADU. market forces can go down. And I, I. Okay, well, you're, you're good. Okay. If you're good with it, we're good. Did you have a chance to think about that? I did, I did. I think to Greg's point, the best solution, Greg, unless somebody has a better idea in respect to the third scenario, meaning the lots over one acre, is to strike the text that says, or at least three units, whichever is greater, or at least two units, whichever is greater, because then they'll be consistent. It's 5%, 10%, 5, 5%, and then you're rounding with that rounding uh, sentence that we put in there. The difference whichever between. Greater, that would come out. In Yes. So okay. you're taking whichever is greater out of Correct. the first one. Correct. And using the rounding like the other two, which okay. we, what we've been working on for the last week, and I apologize for not catching that before, but that that's it. No apologies. So, just yeah. proceed. No, that's good. <laughs> I think we're all good. We missed things. Um, okay. So 750 square feet would be the First Amendment to the first section. Okay. And the, the last thing at the bottom, as I just said, was the the – a clear way of saying how we're going to deal with the rounding situation, 10%, 5%, you'll use that uh, definition of, of rounding there to round up to the next whole number or round down if you're below uh, 0.5. Uh, so do you want to go to the next section, 0.5 or less? Do you want to add qualification to that prior paragraph E? Paragraph E. I didn't hear you. Did you say something about it? I was telling him oh. he didn't have a quite the right one. If not, I'm, I'm good. Just move okay. on. Okay. So we're going to the, to the second incentive, which is for the overlay districts, and we go to the highlighted text. Um, so again, this is for the north north end overlay district and the west end. So <coughs> scroll down, please. Okay. Do you want to mention that there's another section, this uh, proposal is consistent with the findings, goals, and objectives? The current master plan. Oh, yeah. You skipped over that. Yeah. Oh, that was G. on the first one. I G. apologize. Paragraph G. Back up. That's G. Yeah. See, I've got the blue version. If you tried to print that, it's difficult to read. <laughs> Why it's gray here? So yes, uh, <clears throat> this came out of the conversation last week, and what we decided to put in here was a clear reference to the the goals, objectives, and strategies of the master plan to help guide the planning board and the applicant to uh, determining whether the conditional use permit. Uh, should be granted. Uh, okay, so we're into the overlay district and we're down into the community space. The amendment that is on the screen is again dealing with the small projects under five dwelling units. Again, this harkens back to the fact that we got rid of the in-lieu payment that we only discussed back at the very beginning and we needed to make sure small projects were exempt from this and ones that were small projects that either only had a few units, less than five, or were only commercial, still met the existing community space requirement of 20%. So that's what that first section that's highlighted. The second one down below with the, the blue ink is again the reference to the master plan. So you're gonna see this repeat itself, that particular paragraph or sentence. And then the next one uh, is again the master same plan uh, for the community space. And then in the workforce housing, again the same repeats itself again for this incentive to five units or less. Uh, and hopefully all the text there, Greg, is consistent with the first one. Sorry about all the returns and the sentences don't go out all the way to the right. Uh, the words are there. And then the last uh, highlighted sections again repeating how the rounding works. So it's just repeating for each one of these. Yes? 
Just a clerical thing, yes. but after your E that was added about the master plan, then you just renumber F and G instead right, of right, E and yeah, F. Right. That's all. It's a little tiny thing. I'm going to mark that down. E. Um, and just a question for clarification. I've read this over and over, and I'm just having a hard time with the very first paragraph under this overlay in incentive district where we will allow a lot to be located adjacent to or within a hundred feet of a pond, brook, or river. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm got to get there. <laughs> it's just uh, right under number two, very top. Yeah, number two, Point two, two. first big paragraph. Basically, the de definition. Yeah. The yes. second one is more than a hundred feet. I got it, but. The within a hundred feet. Yes, that means the lot actually owns land within a hundred feet of the North Mill Pond. So example of that would be Rains Ave, Green Street, uh, 105 Bartlett. Anything that's touching the pond is a lot that's within a hundred feet. And that and the way the code is currently written and re, and remains with this amendment is those lots that front on the North Mill Pond. The community's preference back to the master plan yeah. is a greenway. And we don't want to have, that's in pole position, that we want the greenway before we're talking about sidewalks or parks or plazas, we want the greenway. That's why it's broken out differently for lots that are on the pond or within 100 feet of it. And pretty much all the lots, uh, certainly in the North Mill Pond, anything within 100 feet is also greater than 100 feet from the pond. They're deeper lots than 100 feet. Everything on Green Street and Rains Ave is more than 100 feet deep. Yeah. I understand everything that you just said, but I guess I'm, I'm just questioning that we would really give a CUP for a property that's within. That's the, not what it's saying. That's not the. That's, oh, it's, right. it's basically saying that the lot line goes within 100 feet. It doesn't have anything to do with us the issuing a CUP. Right. It's, it's really the definition of the lot by meets and bounds and you whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. Okay. And, and prioritizing the greenway over all other things. Yeah. It's, it's because a little. Because of the master plan. It's a little confusing, but that's the way I read it. Is that, that's, that's right? That's correct. Right? Okay. And, thank you. Yeah. And then halfway through that paragraph, that <laughs> we're going to allow the multi-use path to be located within 50 feet of the waterfront. Yep. I mean that that's there today. We didn't. We did. We, this exercise was was more focused on workforce housing and expanding the community space options than going into all the wetland conversations that have been occurring in the last couple of years regarding projects that are along the pond. And I certainly think this is a conversation for the planning board and the conservation commission and others moving forward as you evaluate the wetland ordinance and evaluate how it's being done, that wasn't our goal with this particular set of amendments. Because I think it's a more complicated answer and it partly wasn't it our goal because and we it, actually, we have a workshop uh, coming up with the Conservation Commission yeah. to talk about these issues. It hasn't been scheduled yet, but they've been working oh, on okay. this. We're and, gonna have a workshop with them about and this. De and depending on what is determined at that workshop, yeah. it would also change the language inside this you ordinance. Could do that. So could. It could, it could. If, you know, it could. if it Okay, because yeah. exactly looking at the flood water data, the forecast, <coughs> and the fact that this is tidal water, it's very concerning. It's like we're giving a path that might not be very usable or could be eroded tremendously. So save, as long as we're going thought. to look at that. That's, save that That's another meeting. And okay. Beth, you had your hand Jeez. up. Um, it was brought up at our last meeting, and I know it, we all thought it was somewhat of a good idea, but it was talking about um, keeping buildings at least 10 feet away from the greenway, yeah. putting a buffer between them. Would this be the section that we might want to add that in if we were going to add that? Um, probably. Yeah. Let me see. Uh, can I think about that and we come mm -hmm. back to it? Mm -hmm. Give me a few minutes. Uh, that is definitely the paragraph where you do something like that. Okay. So well, let me notes, so. uh, let me think on that. So if we if we scroll down and we'll come back to it, I flagged it. Mm -hmm. What we'll do here, yeah. Jane and everybody else, yep. is make the 600 750 yep. to be consistent, right? Yep. So that'll be an amendment to both times, both instances. That number comes up. Uh, so th that rounds out uh, the second item with the. Okay, go ahead. Just one more thing. Um, I, 
under D, yep. under the community space options in number D, number, yeah, D. It's, it mentions trees and landscaping. And I thought there was a really good comment in the previous meeting also about stipulating some kind of minimum width of those trees or minimum maturity, minimum width, minimum girth. I, I, I take a different approach to that, and that's just my opinion. Anything that's going to go through this process with the planning board is going to go through TAC and site plan review. And we have pretty specific standards in our site plan review uh, regulations that's for tree sizes, spacings. This is really not the best spot to do that. I, but that I is think. a site plan issue, and we yeah. have the authority to change that. Right. So yeah. Those regulations, rather than duplicating them or creating a conflict between this and those, because they're already your regulations, and they're pretty detailed. And if you want mature trees, uh, bigger trees than the mature trees that are now required, you have, you know, you could amend those regulations. And that site plan regulation is one of the things on, on our workshop list that we haven't had a chance to talk about. Right. So. Andrew, you had a... I have a, what could be a far-fetched question, but in the event that a property like 53 Green Street, which is currently held up in litigation, comes back before us with a different development program yeah. and proposal, which does not include a greenway or that type of community space, what type of considerations are impacted in this type of ordinance? If, if they come back without a greenway? Yeah. So first of all, if somebody, so 53 Green Street, let's imagine nobody's bought it yet and it's still sitting there with a single story building. If somebody bought that right now, they don't have to ask for, right now it's an as of right incentive, right? That's a huge change and I'll keep repeating that so we all remind ourselves, it's an as of right uh, increase in building height in the existing code. You have to provide the community space but you guys can't say no and no one else can either because the code makes it as of right. It's kind of different. It's an incentive that's guaranteed, which is a little odd. That's why we're trying to fix it and level the playing field here. It's called developer's option. Yeah, it's a develop, yeah, thank you, developer's option. So let's assume this passed, and maybe that's not your question, but if, if we need a conditional use permit, if that developer, because this passes, now needs to ask for permission to have a taller building or a bigger footprint, you now have two hands on the wheel to with them to figure out what community space options you'd like them to put on the table. But remember, they're not obligated either in the developer option or in the conditional use permit to do it. So we're not guaranteed a greenway right. just because we want one. That's my, we, that was my yeah, question. We need this conditional use permit or we need the existing zoning to stay the way it is to get one, but even then they can opt out. Right. Greg, were you going to? No, sir. Oh, that was sorry. clear. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So uh, this might not be the most artful way before we go to the third section to answer the 10-foot setback from the building, but uh, you guys can come up with a better way to do this. But that sentence that says uh, a lot of things, a long run-on sentence, wow, it's like five lines. So, go, <laughs> so, so sorry about that. Uh, look at where it says 50 feet of the waterfront in that yep. for. Yeah, maybe right after that and at least 10 feet from the building or something. It, it, there's, mm -hmm. You guys think about that and we can, we can clean that up uh, tonight, hopefully, before we're done. Is, is that good for the second uh, incentive? And we'll go to the third. Okay. So on the third, the first thing we, we heard loud and clear was the concern about the 50,000 square foot building footprint from both the public and members of the board. And you can see it's disappeared. So apologies, Jane. It, it's been struck, but it was language that isn't there now, and we were proposing to put it in, and now it's gone. So it's kind of magically disappeared. So there won't be a 50,000 square foot. You guys cannot approve a 50,000 square foot building with that language uh, removed from the amendment. Uh, so you, the, the developer, if you will, or the builder is stuck with either the, the 20 or the 30,000 or the 40,000 if they're using the uh, underground parking in the, in the second option. So that's been removed in a response to last week's concern, not from everybody, but I think a majority of the commissioners uh, were concerned about something that big being downtown, even though we all know from the analysis presented last week, there are almost no properties that could even do a 40,000 square foot footprint without buying many more properties around them they don't currently own. 
but it's possible. Let's not go back. I, I'm just saying. Uh, so that that's the first change. It's a big one. There's a big one. So let's not go back. I, I got it. I'm just re recapping for point. anybody that wasn't here. I made that Mr. point Mahana. last week. Let's go. Let's <laughs> okay. Go. So uh, the next amendment is again speaking to the multi. So back to Greg's initial question that I didn't answer correctly, but it, it's important to point out. We are mandating that there be mixed-use buildings in this scenario where the other ones are optional. These have to be mixed-use to get this incentive because they're big properties. So they have to do the workforce housing. So if you scroll down, that, this was again all there last week. You can't see the strikeout gray for the 50,000 because it's gone. And then we just have the same language here about the rollover, how you round and calculate. But like uh, Greg pointed out earlier, I propose we strike or at least three units, whichever is greater or uh, in the case of the, uh, the rental, or at least two units, whichever is greater, because we don't need that because of the rounding definition and the re requirement. So thanks for catching that. Um, uh, that's it for the third one. Yes, Jane. Uh, yeah. Um, well, one thing that used to be there that's just like changed um, and doesn't show the strikeout is the additional story in height it used to be 10 feet and now it's 15 feet and yes. I wondered why what is that why do we need that extra five feet yep so <laughs> I think I answered that last week but I'm going to say it again in case uh, obviously wasn't clear um, the reason it's 15 feet we have found eight years or nine years into using this code that the ground floor of these commercial buildings is usually in excess of our minimum 12-foot requirement. So the ground floor of the, many of these new buildings, because they're, they're longer than the old buildings, there's grade changes uh, from one end of the building to the other, the mechanicals are different, the way they put the buildings together is a little different, that the maximum building height that we have in the code, it sometimes doesn't work for the size of the building. It's off by a couple of feet. And an example that I used last week was looking at all the efforts we put into the McIntyre uh, site and looking at that 18-foot drop from Bow Street up to Daniel Street. So it's not a drop, it's an increase. Uh, if you put buildings on Bow Street and you put buildings on, in the middle near Commercial Alley across the road, you're already going up eight or nine feet. There's an opportunity and a need to be able to facilitate a mezzanine floor once in a while in a site like that. And a mezzanine floor is a floor inside the first floor, right? It's actually in the first story, but you'll get almost like the McIntyre building itself. It has really high 18 to 20 foot floors in the existing McIntyre. They designed it that way, and that's not grade driven. That's, that's personal choice to make those floors really thick. That's why we need a maximum height. We don't just say, you can build a five-story building because it'll fit in 60 feet. They only have three stories there, or four stories in the 50 feet because they're big stories. So it's to support a mezzanine, support the mechanicals. When you, when you compress a building, so somebody can come along and actually build a building that's shorter, but the cost for those mechanicals goes up exponentially as you squish them into a smaller space. They have to buy specialized systems. They cost more money. They don't do anything for us. And raising the cost of the building diminishes the incentive for workforce housing, diminishes the incentive for high quality finish on the building, because this stuff never gets seen. It's between the ceiling and the floor above it. Uh, and it diminishes the, the quality of the community space. So it's really about just adding a little more cushion. We're not talking tall, the, the stories don't change. It's still the same height. It just gives a little more of a cushion so we get higher quality space, hopefully, outside the building because they're not spending a lot of money trying to compress into that ceiling. Thank you. I don't think I got it the first time. And then my other question is inside that first paragraph, it's just the way that it's written. It's, I'm not disagreeing with anything, but I just, it, it says, you know, given the large scale of the development, the community space shall include a plaza or square of at least 5,000 square feet per acre comma, a pedestrian passageway, a wide pedestrian. So does the 5,000 square, the way that reads, the only thing that needs to be 5,000 square feet per acre is yeah. that plaza. Yes, the plaza or the square. The rest of them can be whatever they are. And it, it's trying to create a big public space on a big lot 
that has more function. You know, a lot of people have complained that, hey, a wide sidewalk, that seems pretty cheesy to give somebody an extra story just to get a wider sidewalk. What we're trying to do with these larger parcels is create bigger public spaces on the parcel, and it's scaled. So if you have a two-acre parcel, it's 10,000 square feet. If you have a one-acre parcel, which we have many more of than two, it's 5,000. So it's scaled to the size, and if you had 1.5 acres, it would be 7,500. Uh, so it's trying to get to better quality spaces for these large parcels, of which we don't have that many, but we need to do them better than we've been doing them. Andrew. Our public, public observation deck minimum is 500 square feet, and I yeah. know that the next line says the size, shape, location, and type of the community space shall be determined by the planning board and be based on the proposed land use and the size of the location of the buildings. So I get that we have some manipulation over that, but <clears throat> we want more of a public observation deck than 500 square feet, and then the, the developer says no, and then ultimately, like, it's kind of a push-pull. Yeah, it, it could by be. design, it's a negotiated. You, look, right now you have 13 things on the menu, yeah. right? And in this particular case, you've got to do some of them because it's mandatory here, these shell, right? So we're moving beyond that to the observation. Well, this is in the mandatory. Right. So they have to give you 500 square feet of a roof deck if they want to ask for this permit. If you guys decide you want 800, you've got to negotiate for that. You've got to barter for that. You've got to look at what they're giving you and make sure it's fair. But they are only obligated to stand here and give you 500 square feet. And if you want more, you, I mean, that's the nature of the, of the conditional use permit. And looking at the master plan, looking at any specific plan, like a north end uh, vision plan, and determining, hey, the greenway over there is far more important to us, even though you've got a menu with all these things on it, we really want this one. And here's why. We've got a master plan over here, a specific plan that says that's what the public really wants. But ultimately, it's going to be reasonable people being reasonable on both sides. And, and you have uh, well, you have a conditional know. use permit. I don't know about that, but, but I'm wondering, you know, outside of... You can't make it prescriptive. That's the, so let me give you a better answer maybe than that. Yeah, I mean, maybe you you just an example you, about how another, we can there's negotiate. Another answer, there's another answer that you touched on, but one of the reasons that master plan language and citations have been added so many times in this, the Supreme, New Hampshire Supreme Court has not gone along with um, conditional use permits that didn't cite the master plan in the, in the zoning. Yeah if the master plan was tried to be relied on for a decision. So you couldn't rely on the master plan without this wording we're proposing to put in. And keep in mind, we're talking about updating the master plan. Sure. So if we do update the master plan and it comes out through the public interaction that roof decks are really important and views of the river are, you know, super cool thing, that would help with this negotiation. You know, there, you could, you put in, you can put in different prescriptive levels, but the more prescriptive you make something, the harder it is going to be to achieve, most likely. Yeah, certainly, I get it. And I don't think I'm arguing so much about the size, but more about that negotiation you're referencing and what else are we giving up to get a larger public observation deck or community space or what have you. So That's what you'll have to figure out looking yeah. at the list and what they're proposing. And yeah, it's, it's, not an, it's, it's an art and a science, and you don't want to rely on the science because it, it'll never work case by case. Every property is different. Every size is different. You may not want a roof deck if you're in a valley and there's nothing to see, right? Uh, it, 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 you, you've got to find that delicate balance between a, a good floor to start the conversation, and you'll find the ceiling going through a deliberate process with public input and you guys having two hands on the wheel. To the, to the chairman's point, what what I think we should add is an amendment to this. Since we did it in the other two, we should add a sentence at the end of A that repeats the linkage to the master plan, because that's missing in this, this particular incentive. Yeah, and to wrap up my point, I hope that the developers will see our emphasis on the master plan in this ordinance and look at that before coming to us and, and really take that to heart, because that way we'll save some inefficiency and not right. you know butting heads back and forth having them come back for three meetings when we could have done it in one and i and i would just add to that it's going to be really important since our master plan isn't that new you've got to actually make that master plan a useful document because right now it it does not speak to that level of detail so you haven't yeah. just referencing it here is actually sending somebody off on a goose chase you the next step is to update the master plan 
and create specific plans for particular areas of Portsmouth where you can drill down and talk about specificity rather than goals, objectives, and overarching strategies. So the waterfront's different, whether it's a working waterfront or boardwalks along the, the waterfront, the market square, you're going to need these components in your master plan to inform you sitting there and somebody standing here as to what the priorities are uh, when they get here asking for that conditional use permit. So there's a lot of work to do from this point forward on those long-range plans. We're all conditional, really excited conditional about use it. Permits, conditional use permits give the planning board a lot of discretion. Yeah. And it's in my mind perhaps too much without some additional guidance. And that's why since the master plan is a planning board process by statute, that's why the planning board can help enumerate what it's going to do with this discretion and how it's going to use it. <clears throat> and that requires a lot of public interaction to help guide that. So it's, it's a, a master plan the planning board adopts. And when the master plan was done the last time, conditional use permits were a lot newer. There's been a lot more happening since then, both here and in other jurisdictions. So now we know the master plan is more important. Yes, Jane. Uh, and I don't know if it belongs here or not, but Andrew, I thought in the definition of public observation deck, we could, if it's appropriate, add some words in there that make sure that it isn't just public access, but that the public is informed, that they know that this is a public space, that there's signage. Because it's one thing to You're going to want elevator. that universally. You're going to want that. You're right. And we've talked about this. And you're going to need that universally for any kind of public space. That's a site so, plan. That's a site plan. Yeah, issue. it's a good one, like and it, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, but it's a good don't one. forget it because it's important. Okay, so we we I think what I'm hearing is we make a couple of amendments to this section. One is the reference to the master plan. The other is to clean up the uh, lesser or greater than for the workforce yeah. housing units. Was there anything else? Seven fifty as well. Seven fifty. Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the next section is the building footprint, which is now we're departing from the three density incentives, but the, it's, they're linked to the definitions here. Um, I think what Rick has done is take the language that I had presented last week and reordered it. it it's cleaner, uh, but essentially we've got the same mechanics here. It's just reformulated. We'd allow that we still have the 10 foot. Uh, maximum there for community space over street grade if it's on top of uh, subsurface parking. And it'll ultimately only ever be that tall if you're on a really steep site, you know, a site that's got a lot of slope to it. Um, any questions on that? No changes from last week other than the order of the, the restructuring of the sentence. <clears throat> All right, so we'll go to, to what Jane was just referring to, which is the new um, community space types and I think again I think what the chairman did and he can speak to this uh, is add a little more specificity to the pedestrian passageway to deal with the keep looking at my blue copy and can't see it but the uh, the minimum widths eight feet if it's less than 75 feet in length yeah. or 12 feet if it's longer than 75 feet again just trying to create something that isn't this long tunnel scaling. that goes on forever scaling yeah scaling exactly so I think these are good suggestions uh, I think it's better than what we had last week but that's the uh, and they can't exceed 125 feet in length which totally makes sense hopefully they'll never be more than half of that those dimensions came from looking at the downtown. I didn't pull them out of the air. Yeah. <laughs> Peter? One of the um, concerns that Mr. Hewitt had last time was about the, the fire uh, passage. Fire. Is that? We'll get there. Okay. It, it, yeah, we'll get there. It, it's in this list at the, as the screen goes up. Thanks for reminding me. So we didn't change anything to the observation deck, the second one from last week or even the meeting before on the on the 25th the pedestrian uh, public pedestrian arcade again what uh, the chairman has done is uh, reorder the words uh, right Rick and what what did you actually change substantively in that beyond I the, think I added the width it the 10 foot width yep all right I thought I had something in there but thank you for that we it needs to be it should be at least 10 feet because it's it's going to have uh, a structure holding up the outside wall. I mean, I like 12 better, but yeah. 10's a minimum. Ten, so. Exactly. Um, 
So I think that makes it's also, sense. Also, it's generally open to the adjacent sidewalk because that's what a pedestrian arcade is. And I think Andrew showed us some mm -hmm. graphics of that. Yeah. And I think 4664 Maplewood is 10 to 12 feet deep. And it, it's a pretty comfortable space when you're in there. The two arcades, one on Deer Street, one on Maplewood, they don't run full length, but they're they're interesting spaces, and that allows outdoor dining to still remain on private property, but we have a public easement to walk through the uh, the arcade. Okay, so uh, this is, Peter, to your question about um, Jim's comment, uh, both at the 25th and the, the 15th uh, this month at the public hearing. We, we, we've worked hard here, the chairman and I, to put together some language to keep this alive, the idea of a shared, what was formerly called a shared street. Uh, and the, the, the word street was creating heartburn in respect to uh, all the other references in the code today for streets and rights of way. So we've, we've I had changed the language last week to driveway to, to get out of the street terminology and what the chairman's uh, chosen here is street space. I don't think it really matters. It, it, what matters is what gets built and how it functions and how it's written so there's minimal confusion with other sections of the code. So, but essentially what we're trying to do is in the off chance for a large parcel, th these are rarely going to happen because these are not intended to become, this is not like one Congress where they're creating uh, shared streets like Chestnut Street at the Music Hall, which was already the city's, that is a shared street, right, when it's redesigned. There's, there's different pavers, there's street furniture, different lighting. It's very pedestrian friendly to walk from Congress up to uh, Porter. Uh, that, so that's a shared street, but we already owned it. What we're trying to encourage in the off chance somebody like to Russell Street uh, came in here and created what is called, you can call it a shared driveway because it's not a street behind those buildings, but it, it is a fire lane like, like Jim was pointing out. It is access to the underground parking like people have pointed out, but the frequency of vehicular traffic on that so-called driveway that goes from uh, Russell all the way to, and Green, all the way to Maplewood is very infrequent, but it needs to be there but rather than just pave it with asphalt from one end to the other and call it a service alley and, and have it look like Porter Street, uh, we decided, no, th th this building has two fronts. Just because the railroad tracks are there, when you're coming up on, on Russell or you're coming up on Maplewood, you're gonna see this big back of building. We had them at the HDC design the building so it really doesn't have a back. And where it does have back functions for, for access to the parking, or service deliveries on the back, we had them upgrade through the process of the incentive, put a very expensive steel mural, a metal mural going over the whole building in the middle that has the parking above grade on the first floor as well as under. It's got a historic, I, I should have brought it, but it has a, it's, it's a very expensive large mural that goes on the first floor 10 feet tall of historic Portsmouth with boats on it in the waterfront in the North Mill Pond, right there where they're building ships. We also had them replace all the bituminous with pavers, like Chestnut Street, and then put a pattern on it. So it looks interesting. So when you get to the railroad, you're not like, what am I doing here? Because we have the community space going between the two buildings and then just sort of dead ending into an asphalt driveway. We made that back look as interesting as the sidewalk. Is it going to be a spot people are hanging out? No, but they're going to use it to get over to Vaughn Street, to get to other places on both sides. So we did treat that as community space, and I know it gave people like Jim Hartburn when it came back here for the final approval out of TAC, out of HDC, because we didn't have a community space type for a so-called shared street like Chestnut. So we, we took an easement on that for the city, counted it as community space. But what we're trying to do here is in the off chance we ever get another one of these, and the McIntyre's a big enough site, you, there used to be a street that ran through it. Somebody is gonna be standing here in the next year with a plan that'll probably be very different than ours, and there might be a shared street opportunity to go through that site. They should get credit for it, but they gotta build it to these specifications that are not well detailed, but they're obvious what you're, you're spending a lot of money to create this space for pedestrians. Much more refined than asphalt. Yeah, and yeah, way better. It's, it, <clears throat> Nick kept using the term street, and I, I, I think it's giving Jane heartburn. <laughs> um, there's a reason 
there's a, there's a lot to say about this, and I'm going to say a lot. But street space is we're trying to use a term of art that stays away from the statutes, which talk about streets, mm -hmm. and stays away from our regulations in the subdivision and site plan and zoning that talk about streets. Mm -hmm. So it's a space that think of the Vaughn Mall that you could drive on, you know, uh, basically a space like that, and. That's the concept. There are some issues here that the city attorney has raised for us to think about, and Nick and I and anybody else who wants to help think about it between now and the council meeting can do that, but does this create a subdivision? That's something to think about. Um, I'm not concerned about the travel speed versus, because it's not posted speed, it's not, it's not a street. It's talking about how you design something. It's informing the designers you want to keep the vehicle speeds at 20 miles an hour and below. The reason for that is it's safer. I won't get into all the physics. I can. I won't. It's, that's the speed you need to stay below. Um, and well, I think Beth had her hand up first, and then. Um, just sort of thinking out loud at the moment, what if we were to more consider these multimodal pathways so that they would include every form, walking, well, biking? This does. I mean, I, I, it, it we're talking about like names, right? Taking the street away from it, a multimodal pathway would then allow you to put, and just I say, you know, I think the design of it should be to create very slow, mm -hmm. safe pedestrian speeds versus an actual number, maybe. I have um, no, I, I have no problems with that. It, it, the idea is to have a separate. Uh, I didn't like driveway because you know, not to get too George Carlin here, we don't want to park in the driveway and drive in the parkway, but. You know, driveway sounds like a driving place. It sounds like a car place. Um, a multimodal place doesn't sound like that. A multimodal pathway. Pathway to get somewhere. You can put any kind of mode of transportation, whether you're walking, riding, biking. Multimodal way. I mean, I, well, I think you learn that, that you lean the, uh, the opposite with path. I'd right. stay away so from way. maybe a multimodal space. Yeah. Yep, that yeah. too. How about a multimodal space? I'm just trying to, you know, to, if we're going to try to make this get through legal. How does that? <laughs> I think that multimodal works. space. The folks like are happy with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was okay. just going to gra grammatically say, instead of promoting vehicle travel speeds of less than, restricting vehicle speeds. Yeah, yeah. Then, like yeah. rather than a positive to go I less. Think, uh, restricting is enforcement and legal, and that's not going to yeah. work. So no. <laughs> There's a way to words with that. We, we have, as everybody knows, that was on the board for two Russell. We have we put in speed humps to yeah. slow traffic going through there. Uh, for that very purpose. So that's promoting it. That's promoting pro speed? That's promoting it. That's yeah, promoting well, reduced speed. That's called traffic calming. Yes. Do yeah. Do it all the time. Yeah. But if you put a sign up. No, I understand. That's, I understand that. Jane's going to go, wait. So, yeah. Understood. Yes. Um, just a small thing, but um, the examples that are the pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's not the right are picture. Wrong. Nice. Yeah. Good, Jane. And that was for you. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was and a plant. It's actually, what Andrew gave us for it's a commercial shared street, but at least it's got that more of a shared multimodal, whatever you want to call it. Like, I, I like it a lot as an example that shows people doing their things um, for that, whatever we're going to call that multimodal space well, we want to stay yeah, away from we'll, the we'll get an image what i had last time right, was the chestnut saying. street was in there yeah, just so. as a placeholder yeah we'll, we'll, do you think the portsmouth citizens would accept piazza <laughs> i like that <laughs> and, yeah. and, and also like the, the actual title on that. those diagrams needs to match whatever uh, yeah it does yeah, you know. yeah thanks jay multimodal what space? space. Yep. That's what it'll be, and you know we'll we'll get a better image. We'll go, you know. Yeah, the image supposed to look like Chestnut right Street. <laughs> that's that's clearly not it. Okay. So on that, do you want to strike street? Yeah. On the second line, so all share the space and not the street space. Or the multimodal space. <laughs> yeah, replace yeah. street space with multimodal space, right? Mm -hmm. Just say space, either way. I love that term, multimodal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Four doors. And then the, the street would probably be space. And then it would be promote um, slow vehicle travel speeds through the use of traffic calming. I think that works. Yeah. 20 so are you 20 writing that down, Peter? Key number. <laughs> He's I've written it also down. Good. Okay. Because I, I didn't. <laughs> um, okay. 
do we want to go to the last community space type, which we talked about. It wasn't here last week. I think we talked about this on the 25th briefly, maybe. Uh, this was the idea of uh, trying to figure out how at least something like a post office could find its way back downtown through, through an incentive and or something like that. So we've taken a number of passes at this, myself, the chairman, trying to get the language to do what we need it to do. It's very tricky. It's tricky because of things like apportioning the the, the benefit, the carrot to the stick. You know, how much of a how much weight do you want to put in to attract something like a post office? Is it only a post office? And then if it's not only a post office, what other uses are commensurate with a post office? And if they're not commensurate with a post office, then you've got to have a sliding scale because you're not going to give a, 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 a unisex toilet the same benefit that's open to the public as a U.S. post office. So that that's challenging. Then you've got issues of, well, what if the post office signs a lease for 20 years and then leaves in five years? What, what do we do then with giving the benefit in year one and then in year six not having it? So I'm, I think we're feeling like this is a good idea uh, to have something like this, but it's going to need a little more time for us to answer some of those questions. Uh, so it's it so it's sound when it comes out and it's solid and it's defensible and it's uh, equitable to what we would be giving up. I think the chairman's version uh, was 60 percent for a post office, so 60 percent of the required community space. And this, in the words on the page, uh, would be allotted if you had a post office. In my version, it was 25 percent. Your version, it might be 35 or or 90 percent. So I, I think. I'm feeling like there's a larger conversation we need to continue to work on to get this particular type to there's, stick. There's two parts here, and I think what I'd like to hear, first of all, if, if, the, if the will of the board is to do this and it needs some technical work, Nick and I have committed to work with legal to get it fixed before the council meeting, so it wouldn't be a delay. Um, and we'd circulate the text to the board members to make sure everybody's good with it. But there's two things here. There's a post office, and then there's the option for it to be other community buildings. That's, those are two ideas. So they're not necessarily linked. You could say, we like the idea of a post office, we don't like the idea of a community building, or you like the idea of a community building, you don't like the idea of a post office, or you don't like the, any part of it. So those are our options here, uh, and I really would like to hear what what, the what did you guys envision as a community building? What, what do you have any examples? We'll just well, Nick had museum, and um, you know that was probably the best example. Well, I, you could think of a lot of them. You could have a. I'm not advocating anything. You're asking me to think. Yeah, it's just uh, examples. You know, if I'm, so I'm in Somerville right now. Sure. Uh, not stepping on anyone's toes. You could have a small uh, police uh, office station, uh, like a in substation. neighborhood police like a station, a neighborhood substation. Yeah, I mean, you know, those exist on the planet. They do. So again, the the comfort station up to a, a police whatever substation to a to a post office. Th those all have to be reconciled because you guys ultimately the code will be giving up something to get them, and they're probably not all worth the same value. And it's not so simple to say, oh, let's just calculate the square footage and it's a one-to-one. -one. It isn't. We know that. So it, it, it needs a lot of thought, but I think we're at least up for continuing, the two of us and, I'm, and hopefully all of you, to continue to look at this, even if it doesn't happen tonight with this amendment. This is really worth doing because if we can crack the nut and figure it out, what a great way to provide a subsidy to a landlord to get something that has huge benefit to the people of Portsmouth. Picking up on, just quickly, picking up on something Beth said that I partly answers as I'm thinking about projects I've worked on, multimodal buildings that provide services for people and bicycles and other things that give them food, showers, other facilities that, you know, might make it easier to um, use multimodal transportation in the downtown, that's another type of use that could happen. It could be have a coffee shop attached to it. There's a lot of things that can happen with that sort of, and they don't have to be big. So I'm um, not sure what order here. Uh, let's yeah. go Beth and then Jane and then Andrew. I guess my concerns around it is there's a lot of legality around 
private space as community space and how that's defined and how that actually is and putting actual post office in it I think gives me a lot of heartburn <laughs> um, I think that I don't think it's a bad idea but I do think it's an idea that I think needs to be sort of set aside and really thought about and worked on over time till we can really create something that might work versus trying to rush to create something that gets us in trouble and that would be my only concern what kind of trouble a lease on a space for you know someone to use it for the public and then it's not anymore right you have a museum come in well you have a private person that probably comes in to run that museum and they fold and then what do you do with that building right um, it, it, it's the there's ramifications for all of the decisions as to how that could be run so I I do think that we have to stop and think about all of the things that could go wrong with every thought process as to where the community space could go especially when we're talking like whole building or part of a building and the liability of all of that to the city okay Jane I think you were next and yeah I have a comment and a question I don't know if I can remember the question anymore but um the comment is that if the post office is listed at all it should just be as an example because there are many other examples and like you pointed out Nick they all have they all will need to have a different valuation um, in terms of community space the and what incentives they bring for instance my favorite vision and it's one that would be possible should someone purchase that McIntyre property who wanted to build more than one building and wanted one building to be set aside for something like this um, is like a community services NGO centralization building like they have in Dover I mean they have one place where people who are in need can go for for everything from you know food stamps to discuss getting triaged for dental care somewhere I mean it's a, like a one-stop place for the people who are in need and I think something that was linked to NGOs like that would be you know fabulous but I, I don't I don't know about the incentive piece um, to me it seems like something that we should discuss earlier rather than later because of the potential for such a centrally located set of community services in particular um, and I can't remember the and I had a question about it but I, I just don't remember well, maybe you'll think of it that. Uh, Andrew I think yeah my two cents is that it's definitely a valid idea because of the civic contribution mm -hmm. and obviously <clears throat> I mean I work downtown live downtown like my life is very centered around downtown so going to Heritage Ave is out of the way therefore having this civic contribution as well as like really kind of a community place as well um, I know that people would gather in the post office downtown and you have these interactions which are really really nice and organic um, so I, I definitely agree with that thought process I think it also takes quite a bit of participation on the post office part um, you would certainly want to kind of cross-reference what their smallest footprint would be what they can do for circulation and I know it's not a full-fledged post office like heritage would be but 20,000 is a pretty grand space that's a very very large space in my eyes and so it could be half that and I think that we could probably make an argument to the USPS that there is uh, an opportunity to put their business right back downtown rather than you know having none at all secondly um, to Jane's point it, it brings up a really interesting thought where we have workforce housing in the residential space we don't necessarily have like a, a quasi subsidized um, commercial use and a lot of those users in Dover I know are government subsidies or grant service based so if we wanted to attribute community space to something like this within a development program it may be beneficial to say to a developer look we these are our priorities we would love to incorporate these um, we know of these resources that you can tap into to subsidize the leases that they would otherwise be forfeiting so that's where I think monetarily or economically a developer would be uh, appealed um, less so the incentive-based route I think 
Can, can, Donna, can I quickly just respond to a couple of the numbers? And it's only for clarification, not, yeah. not debate or anything. So I did look up what a retail post office has in the design standards for the U.S. Postal Service, and it's 9,600 square feet okay. is their minimum requirement. So that for a retail post office, and this is where Rick and I were going back and forth with text, and we landed you know, here this afternoon, uh, but I think it's it, it's highly unlikely you'll ever get a 20,000 square foot uh, sure. post office, and I think this is a not to exceed or something number, but you're probably talking about 9,600 square feet. And I think it's important because it's only 9,600 square feet. There are many properties downtown that are one acre or more. We're not talking dozens, but we're talking at least 10. This isn't just one place this could land and provide this service mm -hmm. to the people of down, you know, Portsmouth, and particularly people within a half mile or a mile of Market Square. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, the planning department would probably be the, the have the function of finding subsidies or directing people towards subsidies when they're here, not putting the burden on you. But, um, you know, I think we're, we're noodling with these numbers, trying to come up yeah. with a way to do this, because I, I agree with the chairman and many others that have spoken on this. This, more than anything else, is a phenomenal benefit if we can land it somewhere if we're lucky, downtown Portsmouth. And remember, we're mandating 5,000 square feet for a plaza or, or a square per acre. So in the case of a two acre parcel of which we know at least of one, that's a 10,000 square foot open space that that post office would be adjacent to. Uh, so there, there's really, uh, to your point about public gathering spaces, an opportunity for this to be even more exciting than the one we had for 50 years, because it'll have that community space attached to it. Craig, you have a goal? Yeah, I, right. I mean, I think we should, at least the way I'm looking at it, it's a placeholder for a new opportunity for something different and leave it in here the way it is, because we as a planning board can enhance it, change it, refine it. Right. It has to go to council, and zoning has to go to council. Right, right, right. But, I mean, I think the way it's written now, you guys wrote it, where it, it's just a box. <laughs> it doesn't right. have a whole lot of definition. And, and to Andrew's point about other community services, for example, like Gather. I mean, Gather is in a commercial strip out, uh, you know, you know where it is. And that would fit something like that, you know. So I, I like it the way it is. What I don't like about the way it is is that for anybody other than us who have discussed it, who reads it, they go, oh, a place for the post office to come back. I mean, I just think it needs additional examples or yeah, that's, so yeah. that you can think outside of that box. Such again. as. It says yeah. such as. Oh. Yeah. But it doesn't say anything else. I'm wondering if we could possibly get, since we happen to have Attorney Jane Farini in the room, uh, legal's opinion on the direction of what we've been talking about and whether or not there's a direction that would be something that could even move forward, if that's possible. Um, again, these are all um, great suggestions on this particular definition. The first thing that I think needs to be identified is, I think the first thing that was said, the term, you know, what if the post office vacates? Does does the and and how does that relate to the grant? The, you know, the the benefit that they received. How how do you work that? That's a that's a tricky, a tricky piece. Um, the other issue that that I would raise, and you've already discussed this too, is what is a public community building? I think you need to define the building and the building uses. So you're de defining your structure, but you're also defining your uses. I think you can do that. Um, you could, uh, uh, the prior suggestion, I think you have some internal definitions in the zoning ordinance. You have, you know, civic, I think you have some definitions about civic buildings. You could create 
you know, the definitions of 501c3s, you could say charitable um, uses under the, the tax exemption statute. There's, there are ways to sort of cross-reference so you're not reinventing the wheels so you actually have definitions. And the reason why the definitions are important is in the second paragraph of this, when you read other public community buildings shall be considered based on their own merit. So there's no definition of what they are and there's no criteria to determine what that merit is. Mm -hmm. So the plain language is drafted, legal's opinion is it's unconstitutionally vague and unenforceable, that phrase there, because you haven't defined the building, its use, and also you've not developed the criteria through which to review and approve. So that's why we had an issue with, you know, this particular paragraph. Um, and again, I think you're coming back with 10.433, you know, as a as outside of this, it, you could either you know try to you know make some form of a, an amendment to this tonight, or you could just not make a recommendation for this particular definition, add it to your work session, and just bring it back quickly. But you know, once you've had an opportunity to kind of see how all of these issues would interrelate, because. This is markedly different than a pathway, an alley, you know, the way we've envisioned most of the community spaces that have been defined in the zoning ordinance. And this is a, this has layered analysis because it's, you know, again, it's the it's a building, it's a structure, it's a use, and you're getting these credits and then there's these these leases between the owner and this other entity. And how do you modify and kind of check to make sure they keep their 501c3 status. They remain a charitable organization. You know, those things take some um, um, review on a regular basis. So these are the kinds of things when we read this, we were kind of discussing in legal we, what we would like to see vetted uh, before, you know, we would recommend um, the language going forward. Thank you. Thanks. I think some of that stuff we would, we would have to have as a part of the submission during the review process. They would be in writing, binding, and approved by legal before they get their planning board approval. But I think your point about uh, defining the, the merit criteria is a very good one. I think that's something that, if, if that section stays in, should be uh, fleshed out. Any, I, I think before, well, Beth? No, I was just going to say, I, I do really like the idea of tying in, you could have space that would be available for nonprofits to use. Mm -hmm. I think that really sort of talks more to an actual community space minded and to try to give that opportunity for some downtown, I thought would be a nice idea. Or some type of valuable public service. That was a, that was a thought. Um, and the idea of reducing the 20,000 to 10,000 for the post office is completely fine. I think what I'd like to hear, we don't have a lot of members of the public here, but I don't know if anybody on Zoom, I think let's hear from the public and then let's talk about this and try to figure out what we're doing. So unless anybody has anything else before then, uh, the public hearing is open, but now I'm gonna open it up for the public to actually speak. Please come forward, name and address, you know the drill. Brighter property owner 159 McDonough Street. I appreciate all the conversation that's been going on here. I'm almost thinking I could have stayed home. I might need to speak twice, but I'm going to try to get through it without needing to do that. Um, in regards to the multimodal, I'd like it to say way as opposed to space because I want it to think about it being like a long row as opposed to a big open space. That's my two cents. I think the speed that should be suggested unless you've decided there's going to be no speed should be 10 miles per hour. Um, and the reason why is if you've ever lived on a base, residential sections are five miles an hour. 
I had a full size van for years that I could not get to go five miles an hour unless I pushed my brake on. So 10, I think, is a reasonable amount. On 10, 15, 30, the building footprint that you just talked about, it specifically states that um, there should have a story underneath it, if I remember correctly. Let me find that real quick. It says, uncovered community space located immediately above the building story below the grade plane. This is this, that is that. I'm pretty sure underground parking would no longer f fit into that because underground parking is not a story if I'm correct about that. I could be wrong. So the objective of that, if I remember correctly, was to be able to have underground parking underneath and then have, an, have a community space on top. That's something somebody can check into. Um, I also wanted to know, which is a question really for, for Nick, 105A43.43 is for one acre lots, and it, it does 10% workforce housing or, th or three units which for sale or rent, and 50% community space, but 105A4622, which is the overlay district, is 20% workforce housing and 10% workforce housing and 10% community space. And I'm almost wondering if the amount of workforce housing should be greater for the larger lot just something to think about. Um, I'm going to try to make it through this. You already agreed to the 750. If you look at page two of the packet I gave you, it shows how that breaks down. I did that for the ADUs, and it really shows you that you can easily have a two bedroom with 600 square feet. But it shows you how big they are, and um, I use the average bathroom. I have a guest bathroom that's uh, four feet wide, four and a half feet wide, and about nine feet long. So I made my th the bathrooms reasonable. In regards to the density incentive within the overlay district, are you ready, Peter? Because you're going to be writing. So I wrote, um, least, at least 20 feet in width with a multi-use path, get rid of the N that is, parallel to and located within 50 feet of the waterfront with a 10-foot setback to adjacent buildings. Want me to read it to you again? Are you all set or you don't care? Is this in the That's you. I didn't see that. Where is that? What it's not it? there. It's, oh. it's the change. That was the change add, we talked about earlier about the 10-foot. Right. Yeah. Yep. So would you like me to say it again or you don't care? Sure, say one more time. Okay, so it starts with at least 20 feet in width with a multi-use path parallel to and located within 50 feet of the waterfront with a 10-foot setback to adjacent buildings. Okay. So then on 105A46.22, we had talked about the caliber of trees, and I believe it was Corey who recommended they should be four feet. So number 1D, community space shall include four-foot caliber caliper trees and that's the end of that and then the renumbering I think that I Jane think, talked about I think that's four, four inches, inches. Mm -hmm. yeah. four, four inches, inches. Sorry. Four, four feet, feet would be really nice but no <laughs> it'd be a pretty old tree um, I just wanted to make sure that it was in agreement that the 750 square feet is going to go throughout wherever it says 600 okay and um, there's a um, another housekeeping thing on number three density incentives it's a then it's A for community space, and then workforce housing should say B, and then C is the master plan thing. And I already brought up about the, the footprint. In regards to the post office, or whatever you want to call the public community building, um, I agree it should be nonprofits, and they should be scrutinized to some level, because we have museums and art exhibits and all kinds of really nice stuff in Portsmouth that are for profit. So you're going to have to find, and, and some of them, can you put in a UPS store? Because that's, that's a community business. Um, so there's a lot to think about. Uh, the other thing in regards to the breaking of the lease or changing the use, I, I think that you could say that, they, that there's a minimum of how many years that it has to have that use, even if the building says. And um, there could be a dollar value assessed to it. Um, 
and there could and of course because it's community space it counts towards a community space there should be a city easement and that would also help keeping the use because the city would then have control of it because if it's community space it gets a city easement correct so that's my two cents for tonight all of the other papers are uh, the actual what's in the zoning now because some of you were talking about that and um, the actual zoning that's written as it is today before all these changes were made or what on the other pages. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. I have to say folks, and listening to everyone talk tonight about how we're talking about one property, we're talking about a post office, we're talking about a building, the McIntyre word got brought up numerous times. My question is, are we spot zoning? Um, and I think that's a hard, big question that should be asked. You know, I do appreciate the fact that it came from 40 to, or from 50 to 40. Um, but, I have to say, 40 is still a Walmart. 40 is still a Target. So I haven't decided what I'm going to call it Targmart or Walltarg or what I'm going to use. Um, and then we know that can go up even higher if we give them incentives. So you could get up to 70 um, with incentives. I've seen it happen. And then we're at a super Walmart. So I guess I'm really having a hard time with that. I'm having a hard time with um, having an incentive that they build an underground tunnel. That, that incentive really kind of, I don't know where my public benefit is there. Um, I'm having some problems with what truly is the public, what is a public benefit versus what is a builder's benefit. And I guess I was hoping to hear some of those discussions tonight on truly, I mean, I'm not sure on top of a building having a garden is really a public benefit to me when I can't get to the top unless I go through security and go to an elevator. So I guess I'm really trying to figure out the public benefit. I do believe um, everyone wanted a post office downtown. And I know we've been talking about a post office. And I think you can never predict the future. So it depends on what developer comes through here and what they ask for. But I have seen things go and come within days. So to say, well, we can't put that in there because they might leave. Well, anything can leave. So it's really looking at what is best for our citizens, first and foremost, and how does that play out? what is best for our community, what is best for our ecological systems. You know, I think those are the discussions that should be taking place from the a building of this magnitude. Because with incentives, it can grow. And that's a sad thing. I would love to see us say that we're not gonna build anything over 30,000 square feet in the downtown from here on out be done with it. You don't get an incentive to go bigger. That would be the ideal thing. Because my one fear in our community is that we build. Now, some people are already telling me, Esther, why do you care about building? You should love it because it'll help your business. And you're right, it would. But my fear is we become another Boston or something else. And why do, want, why do I want to come here to visit? And we see that with Portland. So I question making it so big and so monstrous and so tall that we change our character of our zoning. Now I spent hours and days and days with Nick doing the initial character um, zoning with Portsmouth Listens and, and, all, and a lot. And you know, the one fear was giving up our neighborhoods, giving up our downtown. So I guess I don't want to see a building, a super Walmart or a Walmart Target in the middle of our downtown because of size and massing. So 
So I would encourage you to really think about this. This is an important um, pattern. You are making decisions for the city into the future, and I thank you for all your work. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Page Trace, 2078 Gott Street. If we let the genie out of the bottle, let's all just discuss this as it is. It's preventative, almost too little, too late, for McIntyre. It is very likely close to what one could consider spot zoning. Um, it is obviously being looked at and pushed through very quickly. Why? Is the effort to push it through before McIntyre's actually sold? The bottom line is, while I applaud the chair and this board for bringing the square footage down to 40,000 feet, the speaker before me is absolutely correct. The minimum square footage for a Walmart or a Target is 40,000 square feet. That is a Walmart in what we've all thought of as the heart of our city. That, is, that would be with the incentives that are in this packet, the start. And I look at things that are in here, and I think for the life of me, I don't even know where to begin. Because frankly, the community plan that was part of McIntyre has gone through at least two iterations that most people don't even know about it. We can now actually safely call it, with all due respect, the Senior Planners Plan, SPP for short. Because that plan, if you could locate it on the city website, had a first floor in one of the new buildings that was actually a floor and a half or two floors. So that's where we get to the 15 foot ceiling. Because of course we have to have a mezzanine or make an allotment for it. But nowhere, at least, let's have the courtesy to no longer refer to the community plan when it comes to the McIntyre. This city is not supposedly not going to purchase it. It will be purchased privately. The community plan, what this community went through charrettes for, decided upon, is long gone. And now we're all just trying to fit, you know, a size 13 shoe in a shoe box meant for a size 7 shoe. That's the best way I can use. These are all lovely thoughts. They might work on any property somewhere else. But you're tasked with, at the moment, worrying about McIntyre. At least that's what the city manager and the city council would like you to look at. So I ask you to tread carefully and look at these things. Commissioner Bengala, I applaud you for questioning the workforce housing size because I too believe that 600 square feet is not a humane place to place four people to live in. I also find a question when I read the issue of the two different types of passages one is um, a passage and the other is an arcade. And essentially the, the wording for both is the same. So to sit here and say pursuant to planning board throughout all of this, calculations for workforce rounded to the nearest 0.5, calculations are, where is it? Proposal is consistent with the findings and goals and objectives of the current Portsmouth Master Plan. I realize you need to have that in here legally. But honestly, can we please just look at this and actually take it seriously? 
How wide does, a, does an arcade need to be? We're worrying about whether a 501c3 is going to be in existence 10 years from now. Well, I represent a 501c3, and we've been around since the 19th century. We're not going anywhere. Why should anyone else? A museum is a great idea. But a lot of this really, really smacks of someone upstairs wanting the McIntyre taken care of before it's sold. And I just ask you all to have the decency and the honesty and the respect for the citizens of Portsmouth that we stop with the incentives and as someone said, create a size. That size will be appropriate for every one acre parcel and it'll fit. Instead, we're worrying about whether it's a multimodal way or a multimodal path. And I feel like I'm saying she sells seashells by the seashore. Come on, guys, this, this is serious stuff. And you have a brilliant chair and very smart people behind it. But somewhere you've lost sight of what spot zoning is and the size of buildings. And I'm really concerned because I don't think this is what the residents of Portsmouth are going to have in mind when they start to see it go up. And you all will be at the front line of it, right behind the city council, who will have authorized it because you say so. So I would say you all start asking the hard questions now, because there are a lot of residents in this town that are counting on you to ask the hard questions and to act on them. I'm one of them. And I'm asking you, please, think about what you're voting on. Because obviously, this public hearing is still open. And when it closes, I'm worried. Thank you for all your service and everything that all of you are doing. Thank you. Any other comments about the proposals we have this evening? One on Zoom. If, if no, else. Nobody else in the room, two, four, against. We have one person on Zoom. Bill Downey. Go ahead, Bill. Can you hear me okay, Rick? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. Uh, forgive me if this is uh, improper right now. I came to the meeting late, but uh, one of my concerns um, is that uh, in regards to Jim Hewitt's comments about equal benefit, I feel historically, in, in more cases than not, um, we've gotten the short end of the stick. And I, I hear the argument about, um, you know, dressed up fire lanes and such, but pocket parks and alleyways behind a building so they can, you know, um, expand their footprint just doesn't square with me. So I appreciate the consideration. I would just like to see if we can define better what would be I think a, a, a better deal for the citizens in the city. Um, what tends to happen is there are more amenities for the tenants than public benefit. Like on Woodbury Ave, there's a green space. No one's going to sit down and watch the wheels go by uh, in, in reality. So um, I also want to just thank you all for your, your hard work. I know it's a nice summer night. It's beautiful when you're inside doing this hard work. And I've never seen a planning board do this kind of uh, uh, work and hard effort. So thanks to everyone. And Nick, if I don't see you, best of luck. Thanks for your service. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Any? No, no. Yes. Liz, go ahead. Is Nick going to, Elizabeth Brighter, property owner 159 McDonough Street, is Nick going to speak again? Or he's all done speaking? Uh, he's done speaking unless the board has questions of him. Okay. So it's my understanding when I read all of this is that the maximum building size is 30,000 square feet above ground and that the only thing that can be 40,000 square feet is a parking garage, just like what's happening on Russell, uh, 2 Russell Street. And I just want to have that confirmed. I'm pretty, th pretty sure the way I understand the new zoning is its maximum building size is 30,000 square feet unless you have a parking garage, which is allowed to be 40,000 underneath. That's it. Yeah. 
Well, so the board understands. I think in CD5 you can have a 40,000 square foot, up to a 40,000 square foot no, building. No. Currently? Currently. So by taking the 50,000 out, that's what it defaults to. Now, um, public hearing is still open. And I just want to have a conversation with the board before closing it, if we close it. Some of the points that were brought up, first of all, I just want to dispel the idea. This is not spot zoning, not even close to spot zoning. Don't, it's, it's absolutely, positively not spot zoning. And I, I know that professionally, so don't worry about that. Um, I gave this board a list of things that I wanted us to address in workshop sessions last year. And one of the things includes building size in the downtown and some of these other things that we just haven't had a chance to work on. What we're talking about, this is a comprehensive amendment that affects multiple properties, as Nick presented at one of our prior meetings. I don't remember which one, but there are at least 18 or 20 different properties that this applies to. And it applies to them in different ways because they're different sizes. It applies to them in different ways because also they could be recombined into different size shapes. It's, it's an endless myriad of possibilities that we can't address realistically. Um, but we know there's at least about 20 parcels that this amendment could address. If we reduce, if we propose to reduce what is currently permitted, that is considered a down zoning. That would be a matter of some concern to me where there are things pending for certain properties in the downtown and any property. And if you do propose to down zone somebody's property, there's a whole separate set of criteria that can apply to notice requirements and other things that we have to give consideration to, which we haven't touched that. Now we could. Maybe we will. It may be part of the master plan update process. I personally am concerned about a 40,000 square foot footprint. It ties into also building coverage, which is a different definition. Both need to be looked at, I think, in the downtown and see what the public thinks and what this board thinks. But we need graphics to understand that. Andrew made this point and he's given us some graphics tonight. I think with my technical background, I know what it looks like different size buildings, but most people don't have that background. And I want you to I want everybody to understand what we're talking about with these, these numbers. So we have the ability to advance the 5A, I'm just going to call the entire section the 5A amendments that the council brought to us some time ago. It's a recommendation. It's a council decision of what to do. If, if it goes forward, it could be with exactly the amendments and things we've talked about this evening by consensus. The thing we haven't really achieved a consensus on is at the end, the post office and community building section. Um, we've heard from city attorney on that. We could, we could do not, neither of those. We could do just the post office. We could do both the way they are with the understanding that Nick and I get to work on it more. And we'll do that. If, the, if this board wants us to do it, we'll do it. And anybody who wants to help us can help us. Uh, and we'll do it before the council meeting. So that's technically covered. Um, or, <laughs> wild and crazy, we could continue for another discussion next week. I really don't want to do that. And I, I'm sure you don't want to do it. But uh, I, think, I think we're ready to do something tonight, and I, I would prefer to do something tonight. Um, so with that as an introduction, board discussion, um, the hearing is still open. I think Jane threw her hand up first, and then Andrew. Yeah. Um, uh, personally, I, I don't love the idea of a 30,000 or a 40,000 square foot building, even in these, um, like even in CD5. But the way that I'm reading this particular um, document is that the emphasis is actually on trying to get incentives should developers really continue to come in and build at mass. I don't know, my, my question is, if we wanted to limit the size of the building both across, across all character districts, where would we do that? We wouldn't do that inside this document, would we? Would we, would we that'd be actual zoning changes, right. wouldn't it? 
Yes. Um, as you know, for like more than a year now, I have encouraged us to revisit the master plan because to me the master pl well first of all I'd love to hear from a wider group of citizens I'd, I'd like to hear from all citizens in terms of the vision for our city and that drives all of this and I've long wanted to do that um, the other thing that I've, as you know, I've been talking to you about and um, questioning is how do we, go, if, if we want to stop the level of massing and infill that's currently occurring, are there other mechanisms for that? Um, I have a lot, That that's where my druthers are. I mean, I, I think that as a planning board, we should be looking at all of those things, including possibly doing the assessments that are required both for a master plan revision and towards a possible growth maintenance ordinance. A, a, a preliminary assessment is required really for both of those, and it's an opportunity to hear from the public. That's sort of where I am with this at this moment. I think there's a lot of work left for us to do as a planning board. I'm anxious to do it before all of our terms just expire. Okay, I, I'm with you on the master plan and all that. I think if we could focus on, the other option is we don't do anything. We don't give the council recommendation. I think I don't support that idea, but that is an option. Um, I think Greg and Andrew. Yeah, they are, doesn't matter. Yep. Okay. okay. <laughs> I expressed a concern a long time ago about this whole down zoning analysis, and I don't think we've been given enough data, left hand column, right hand column, and I agree with the folks out here. I mean, we've been talking about the McIntyre too much, but if we down zone that lot, we're going to get sued. I mean, if if you took a parcel of mine and it has a three-story building on it and said, well, it burned down, so now you can only put two two stories on it, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I mean, that just wouldn't work, and I don't, it, it, it doesn't smell right. And I don't think we've been given enough data about the various parcels that are going to be affected. It's one thing to say we have 20 parcels that are being affected, but how many people are being down-zoned in that is my question. And then moving on to the big picture, um, you know, the last thing you know, we all added is the public community building. I think it's a great idea, but I think we need more details. Mm -hmm. So great. I don't know that we can get this done in the next hour. <laughs> no, that part couldn't get done, but the idea it could, get, the rest of it could get done with a, a formal recommendation with the last and if Jane wants to interrupt me, I'm going to, you know, you can do this, but I think the last part could be a recommendation provided that these details were worked out before the council meeting on the 10th, whenever it is. Okay. And now she wants, she's going to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> Something about notice, I'm sure. Yeah, the, the, you wouldn't be able to vote on that language, you know, as a, as a board. Um, you could say this is my suggestion as chair, you know, or um, but it wouldn't have wouldn't be a formal vote of the board on the on the language, so it wouldn't um, technically be the board's recommendation. Um, you know, the final version of that edit. It could be a concept recommendation with a follow up with Nick and myself, or just Nick at the council meeting to explain the details, perhaps. But I understand the difference. The difference, that's what, that's what I was trying to explain. Yep. Up until that point in this, if the, if the board wants more detail, the rest of it, I think we worked through most of the details. All the details, actually, I think the rest of it. Um, Andrew, I think you were, and then Beth, I think you were, did you? Um, yeah, some really good public comment, certain concerns that I think we've all been thinking about. and. Uh. 
where my head goes is more to the engineering and schematics of what a 30 or 40 or 50,000 square foot building anywhere downtown would look like. And schematically, I don't think, could be wrong, I don't think that someone could pull that off and <coughs> conform to both TAC and like water runoff and lot coverage ratios while still being within these guidelines. So in my head, I've ruled out a lot of sites where somebody would actually have to break up the building and they would have to divide it or they would have to not build that large. So I, again, it could certainly be wrong, but I don't think that there are many sites, if any, that you could just go out there and uh, roll the balls out and build a 40,000 square foot building with no issues. You would have to do a lot of conforming and uh, engineering wise, I, I don't think that we would see that just come right before us. In addition to the fact that you, with these incentives, like a 5,000 square foot community space, like um, you know other passageways, arcades, et cetera, that we've discussed tonight, um, you would not be able to incorporate all of those elements into the development scheme while still maintaining a 40,000 square foot building. So again, I keep reducing it in my head to these buildings being broken up and I'm not discrediting the, the public comment nor the comments about this, the, the massing, but I just don't know if it's like feasible engineering wise to, to really just do it. So um, I'm, I'm reserving my guilt that way, I guess. Okay, Beth. Um, so we are not down zoning on any of this uh, that we have presented here. The 30 and the 40 is, is in the code today. So right. in order to change that, we couldn't do it through this process. We would have to do it in a separate process just because of the way it has to be noticed and the way it would move forward. So, and I, I agree, we would need a lot more data in order to make those determinations. And that might be part of the continued look that we land use will be doing at incentives. This is not the end of the conversation. This is the very beginning of making these changes. I, I, um, I would just to clarify, I was making that comment in response to public comment to try and let them understand mm -hmm. where we're coming from. We can't really take 30 and go to 20 right now, or right. it just ain't gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, and if I can ask one question, I believe of um, Nick, uh, it came up in public comment regarding um, 10.1530, the building footprint, um, and about underground parking. I just wanna make sure that we aren't discounting, you know, that underground parking would be, you know, wouldn't, you know what I'm saying? It's a story below grade, which means 50% of that story has to be below grade. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially a basement if it's 50% or more below grade. So that community space can sit on top of that. So whatever portion, it could be 49.9% of that story is above grade, community space can sit on top of that. It can be 40,000 square feet, that, that footprint. And can it be parking under the community yeah. space? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I just wanted to make sure. Just while well, I'm standing here, if I could just reiterate what you said and, and part of what Greg was saying. Uh, the downzoning thing's not unimportant for everybody in the room to, to fully understand. In respect to the parcel you were, I think, referring to rather than all parcels, there is no downzoning here, as Beth said. Uh, the only change to this code from a, from a development right standpoint is shifting from a as of right scenario for the incentive in the case of the overlay district and in the case of the large parcels, we know the third one, the large footprints, already requires a conditional use permit, right? So we're, we're, we're getting a situation where there's more balanced decision making on the incentive by moving all three to the same level of a conditional use permit. But the underlying development rights, what somebody can do with any of these properties is not lesser than what is here today before we make this amendment. So that large parcel you're referring to is not diminished in any form other than making a, an argument that somehow the conditional use permit for two of those three options and one they're disqualified from because they're not in the overlay district, 
So they're being treated in fairness like the AC hotel that needed a conditional use permit or Mark McNabb with the brick market that needed a conditional use permit to have a larger footprint. So it, it's sort of making them all equal, not diminishing any values, not setting ourselves up for, for removing development rights. And just to underscore that, we, we again, uh, I think I made the mistake last week of doing it the same way, remembering this at the end of the meeting. We have a map change, which, which I glossed over, or it dropped off the screen, down on Bow Street. Just to reiterate for anyone in the room that, or so, if you didn't see this last week when I made the same mistake of forgetting to, to spend time on that. Right now, the existing building height down on Bow Street is 45 feet with a 10-foot provision as of right. To go to 55 feet, that orange turns into 55 feet. We're proposing to make the orange green. That'll drop it, yes, by 5 feet to 40 feet. But by giving it the 15-foot uh, conditional use permit for added height, it ends up at the exact same number, 55 feet. So there's no diminishment of uh, development rights in respect to even that map change. It, and it's trying to be more consistent with what's there today and the streetscape along Bow Street. I have a suggestion for the board to consider. What if we advance the proposal to the council as, rec as amended and as we amended it this evening up to and including the post office section because I think that that is an important thing and there are imaginable horribles that we can try to contemplate. We probably won't. But to take the community building off and to make that something that we work on before, do we just work on it? And it's part of something, we'll, we'll get it figured out. Um, won't make it a part of the July 10th council recommendation. That way, this board's comfortable with what it's doing. You're not wondering what the heck are Nick and Rick doing, you know, when we're not meeting. So that's not gonna happen. Uh, so that's my suggestion of something we could do. Yes. I fully agree with that suggestion because I think then at our next um, planning board meeting, if we have that at a point where it could come back, it could then be a follow-up recommendation. And considering all of these amendments to this, I'm going to have to bring forward um, to the city council meeting because they've already posted it based off of the original. Um, I can talk about that at that time and let them know that there's still a further recommendation of a, another space that's being worked on that we could add to it at a later date. In order to get a motion, we will have to close the yeah. public hearing. No, just I know. For the I, I just. I, <laughs> I, I, it, or so, are, it, or if folks are comfortable, I'll close the public hearing. I, I just have one question. Yes. So, if we do have some additional suggestion around the post office suggestion, we have more chance to t talk to you about that or, or share that. I don't have to do that now. Well, you could do it tonight. I mean, what I suggested was we will advance it tonight, okay. reducing it to 10,000 square feet. Um, so I, I had taken off the idea of additional, I mean, I do, I'll do it. I mean, I, you know me, I'll, I'll work like an idiot on this stuff, but um, I don't think there's any more that has to be done for that. I think there is more that has to be done for the community building. Right. Community building, I think we need to talk about. Because you guys come with some good ideas, so. Um, uh, did, did that include a percentage of community space with the post office scenario? It's written in there, yes. It says 40, 60 percent. So 60, 60, 60, 60, it's a significant no, And, and therefore about. we are recommending that? Mm. We, it's in there. If you want to propose something different, say oh, I think chance, we should. But I think we should chop that right down. Uh, well, like, let's, let's talk about that. Um, yeah, I just. I'm going to close. I'm going to give the public one more opportunity for a brief comment if you have to make one. Otherwise, I'm going to close the public hearing. Please limit your comments to the zoning. Um, Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Uh, I do believe that the post office needs to go back, revert back to what was originally written and that it should be uh, no more than 20,000 square feet. That should be the post office's purview as to what side, size or dimension they might need. 
they will accept a minimum of 9,600 square feet, and we're offering them a full 400 square feet more. I think it's not up to us to tell the post office. The post office tells us. Um, and so I firmly believe that's what should happen regarding the post office. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody on Zoom put their hand up? Yeah. Mr. Kennedy, for the record, 41 Pickering Ave. Um, a couple things. The updated stuff came out at 4 o'clock today, which I think was appalling. Um, and I think that when the city does stuff for people to speak, that needs to be um, looked at if we truly want to have a conversation. But maybe, given what Council Rhoda said, where it's already been posted, there really isn't truly want for a conversation. So I just wanted to have both those things on the record that it's already been posted, so there isn't any accessibility to have longer term and talking about this through. And what was presented tonight was posted at 4 o'clock today or after. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you very much. Yes. I just want to try to clarify when I said it was posted, it was posted for the second reading for July 10th as it was presented to this board. We will have a public hearing at City Council on July 10th for second reading. My um, understanding from the legal department is if the city attorney it determines that any of these changes we're proposing that I will bring forward are material that we will have to then, it'll go to the next City Council meeting. So there will be then probably two opportunities for a public hearing at second reading. So I just wanted to make sure that the board was clear on the process moving forward. And just so folks know, the Portsmouth City Charter process is a little bit more cumbersome than the statutory process, but it is what it is, and that also requires a council change. So, but exactly what Beth said is exactly correct from the charter. So, are we ready for a motion? No. no. Why are we talking about the post office percentage? But we're going to take that out of what moves forward so that we can continue to work on it at our next meeting. Oh. We, well, we talked to, I, I suggested keeping the post office and the community building out. So the. That section. That, she, just that one just section. That, okay. that I, picture. The picture and the, that Public text, community that, building. Correct. Temporarily. Right? Well, I think he's saying the second part of that that starts with other public community buildings that paragraph right. would come out and leave you would leave in but if the but, that, yeah, that's, that, what that's, I, what, that's what i that's what i said i understood it to take the whole section out public community buildings and keep working on that as a whole i, 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 I propose to keep post office in but it's whatever the board wants to do so yeah i'm just a bit confused i just i we had one request for or, or a comment about you um ups I, I don't know about like some type of multi facility that are, uh, handles multiple vendors like FedEx, UPS. No, that's called, parcel, a, that's called a business. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just getting. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. But I, I just genuinely am sometimes. confused. So, in the weeds. It's rather prescriptive the way that it is written with a USPS in there. Do I understand the intention? Yes. Do I understand or do, I don't understand why it's in the public community building? category it's a public use and it's technically like it's quasi it's a civic, it's a civic use civic okay. use a quasi governmental also for-profit business so like we're just it's very trepidatious the way that it's written and the way that we are proceeding with that it, from an urban planning perspective post offices are at least today and I don't know what it'll be like in 50 years but at least today they are places of public gathering and they provide the, the, the benefits the so corollary benefits of having a post office are many so that's why it's generally considered in many jurisdictions as as a community or civic building yeah and I, I said that earlier and I still agree with that but I just need to know how we are recommending it and which We're not one? doing anything yet. I think Beth wants to make a motion, so. I'd like to make a comment first. It would be my suggestion and my hope that we take public community building section out in its entirety because I really think we could start to think about a 
public buildings community space as something that is either a government use or a nonprofit use with public benefit as determined by the planning board. I think something a little bit more like that and then flesh out all of the ramifications versus actually, and then maybe as um, Councilor uh, Begalia said, we could possibly then do examples of what might be an acceptable if we wanted to go that far and maybe so a post office further define it further defining as examples so you know could be but not you know in legal terms you know could you know, not in not limited to but you could give then examples of what that might be and i just think that might be a better way to approach it so that it's not singularly looking at one thing for sure Agreed. Right. that's Agreed. why that's why there's two sections and i thought a post office is a very specific thing we know what it is we know what it does that's why have it separate and then work on the other part. But it's what, whatever you guys want to do. And I'm going to stop talking about it because I've talked about it enough. So, if someone I, wants to make a motion, make a motion. I'd like to make a motion. Um, and I think I will just start with the really super easy one that um, because we need a separate vote, uh, because I believe it'll have to come back for a first reading um, at City Council, but Section 10.433 Building Structures and Land, um, as it's changed on the first page of our. Um, amended packet that we recommend to city council uh, to take a look at this and send it back for a first reading um, at on July 10th yeah we're gonna <clears throat> that was gonna be a se just a separate vote right that's why I'm doing it first and getting it out so of the you way want to do it right now okay <laughs> yep that was my motion it, that's just uh, I'm not sure I heard. so it's just that paragraph mm -hmm. yep is there a second get a second Okay. Second. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the reason for doing this is because this wasn't originally posted or requested of the planning board to look at. So we can bring it back to a recommendation, but then it has for the process port, it will have to start at first reading right. and then move forward. And it's just that one section. Simple but confusing. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sorry. Let's <laughs> <laughs> try to explain why I was doing it this That's way. That's why you got my second. <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And then I'll go on to the much more um, complicated um, motion. And I will start with uh, the changes as I understand them for section one. And I believe we wanted to add between um, in 5A 4343 section E qualifications between state law for either in order to make that a little bit clearer. I know that was part of our conversation. So adding the qualifications there and then changing um, further in section E, 600 square feet to 750 square feet. And all else as printed on this, I believe is correct. I think that's it. Okay. Then I will move on to the second section, density incentives, um, 105A4621 where we're going to add after the located within the 50 feet of waterfront to be with a 10 foot setback to adjacent buildings. And I'll let legal also will be able to take a look at this to make sure that we're wording it all correctly. But that would be the changes and then the um, changes that are follow that along with the number two under workforce housing where once again the 600 square feet will change to 750 square feet plus the changes that are there. Everyone follow me so far? Uh, and we move on to section three, the density incentives. Um, community space A stays the same. We are going to have um, community space B, workforce housing, where we're going to take out or at least three units, whichever is greater, or at least two units, whichever is greater. And we're going to change 600 square feet to 750 square feet. And then we're also going to add that it's consist consistent with the findings and goals and objectives of the current master plan. I believe those are all the changes for that section. And then under um, section three with the amended um, pedestrian places, we're gonna add the pedestrian passageway, the observation deck, the pedestrian arcade, and then the shared public multimodal. We were going the space, someone suggested way, I could go either way. Um, and then taking out whatever we take street out and then just changing it to promote vehicle travel speeds. Um, I think you had to slow vehicle. Slow traffic, see I did, was reading that instead of my note. <laughs> promote slow vehicle traffic speeds through the use of and then continue. 
Travel speeds, not traffic speeds, right? Yeah, travel, yeah. <laughs> travel, slow travel speeds, yeah. I can't even read my own handwriting, it's so sad. And, and remove entirely for the moment public community building that's listed here so that the planning board can continue to work on that section and send that back as a separate recommendation at a later time. That is okay. my long motion. Beth, if I could agree with you, because oh. you, you left us in. I did leave out, so sorry, section four as printed in there as well. Motion. Oh, you you asked a question and sort of in the middle of there way versus space. I like this public suggestion of way of way. Okay, so multimodal way. Yeah. I like way too. All right, we'll go with way. Way instead of space. Way is a little bit street like. Um. <laughs> I that's why I said pathway. No one liked pathway. So <laughs> are you spelling it W H E Y? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's nine o'clock. Right, Was I, there a second to that? Not yet. Comprehensive motion. I'll second it. Okay. I think I. I think caught it all. I think you covered it. I guess. Took and, a lot of notes. Uh, I couldn't I read. I get the sense that the board doesn't want to include the post office. So. I think if if everybody's good. Any discussion? Don't want to include it, but I'll certainly help you refine it. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to yep. do it. I want to include. I like including it in the final. I just don't like pigeonholing it early. Mm -hmm. it, you don't have to. It's explain. optics. It's if, optics if not, to me. No, you have to be comfortable with your vote. It, it's right? really just optics. I think it would read weird. Mm. Sorry. You'd be right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I have a recommendation. You got it done. Um, I think, yes, Please Jane. don't adjourn. I wasn't going happens. to. I wasn't going to. I was. Okay. I'm not going to keep her. There is. Go ahead. Did you? I I just wanted to have an opportunity for us to set our uh, another special session if we, you know, uniformly agree on that, um, to start working on any one of the that's in the long list that you have provided that we've sort of amassed together, we've put together, together, um, because otherwise I just see us as a group that's just going to be led by the next thing that's submitted by the Land Use Committee and not really get to direct our own, you know, special sessions as well. We have plenty of work that I think is of a critical nature. I've been saying it for over a year about let's launch into looking at a process for revision of the master plan and that's just my personal opinion maybe others have other priorities but i want to make sure that we get in some that work because otherwise frankly there's another year and a half and another year and a half of doing work that's important but i don't think is the quintessential mission of the planning board is just something that I'm not going to be happy doing. Uh, I, unless we start to address some of these other priorities as we as a group put together, um, it's just way too passive for me. Well, I completely agree with you. That's why I did that list of things for us to work on. We've had, you know, we were requested by the council to work on this amendment we did uh, tonight was supposed to be a workshop meeting to talk about the master plan um, one of the many things i've been working on is a scope of work for the master plan consultant that i plan to share with the board the next time we talk about this so with that being said can i make a motion that a concrete placeholder be put on the agenda for our next meeting specifically for a scope of work for the master plan And if At it, our regular it, meeting? How, do you yeah. have any idea how our very next meeting. Our, well, we won't know until next week is the deadline, so we won't know. But do you, do you have any? Do you have much much yet? Um, we have a couple, but nothing too major. No. But, but I think to James' point, I'm going to stick with that motion, and I, I request a second. I, 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 I say I say we bump an applicant because. This has been sitting for a year. We don't have to bump an applicant. So We're not going to have to bump an applicant. We want it on the agenda, and if we get to ten, if we get to ten o'clock and continue, we continue. You made a motion. James I made the motion. It. I think you explained it. 
Uh, so the motion is to have a an item on our regular agenda at the next meeting to talk about the scope of work for the master plan. Correct. Any other discussion about that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We'll bring so it'll be on the agenda. And I don't remember what our workshop, I, I think our doodle poll sort of doodled out. It, it doodled out. It out in July and August. But we do have regular standing work sessions scheduled for the uh, fourth Thursday of every month. So we can reassess at the regular meeting where I can send out another poll. And well, if, if folk, the extra Thursday of every month, look at your calendars and let Peter know if you actually have time that you may not have thought you had time. This is, this is important stuff. Yes, Beth? I just want to note that the July, the Thursday after our meeting happens to be um, when the tall ships are arriving that afternoon. <laughs> so, so we can meet on the tall ships. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to be on the gondola that evening. So <laughs> um, it might be difficult in July, but probably starting in August, it might get a little bit easier. I just know by the end of July sure. and beginning to middle of August, there's a lot of uh, course of 400 events going on in that short period of well, time. Well, while, while we have a uh, esteemed counselor present, since the budget just passed, do we have, is the master plan now funded? As of July 1. That's when the new budget takes effect. Okay. So we have to get through the end of June to finish So for the our structuring, year. we right. can talk about big things like the consultant. Yes. Let's go for work. So we can talk about this stuff in July. Great. Mr. Chairman? Yes, we'll break. Could we, could we allow um, Nick Cracknell to come to the podium before the meeting breaks? Allow him to come forward? Yeah, I believe this might be the last time we see him. And, uh, uh -huh. What? You've been summoned, what? Nick. No way. <laughs> Not you. Yeah, I just wanted to say, given this is likely my last uh, opportunity to be before you, I, I just want to thank you all for your service, your contributions and all the support you've given me over the years. I've been here 12 years. It's, it's, we've seen a lot of things happen, at least in my short time. But I'm really appreciative of the opportunity and the honor to work for the city and be able to work with people like you that ask the challenging questions and uh, hopefully make us do our job uh, as best we can to advance the interests of, of Portsmouth. So I appreciate everything you've given me here. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for your all you've done. Nick, I've actually got the opportunity to work with you since you started here. So thank you for. I've been volunteering with the city since for. But I think I'm on my twelfth year as well. <laughs> so and, thank and, you. And quickly, um, Nick, before you step away, I, I've worked with you for a long time, going back ten years on HTC. And uh, when I left the HTC, you had some very kind words for me, and I want to I want to extend that to you as well. You said to me, and I can say it right to you back, I've learned a lot from you, and uh, you will be sorely missed by a lot of people. And you, um, you are, you are ex you're, you're an ultimate professional here at City Hall, and uh, you really are, will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. So that we're adjourned. Motion adjourned, yes. Right. Nope.